Hey friend, I want to ask you, I want to ask all you returnees and converts, what made you become religious? Was it the food, the people, the culture, the Talmud, the language? And friends, if you chose any of these things, perhaps you should rethink your journey. Why? Because, friends, the only valid reason anyone should choose to join any religion is for access to divine truth. To hear and learn things that man could not have come up with themselves, right? Because if not, why don't you just go to college or go to your local library if you just wanted to hear the opinions of men? And of course, there are many different reasons that someone might want or need that divine truth. Perhaps to make the world a better place or to help themselves with their own problems. So, friends, what if I told you that around 85% of what occurs in the Jewish world today is made up? Completely manufactured. Now, this should not be a controversial statement. And honestly, the only individuals who should get upset at hearing this are people who really do not know the origins of the bulk of Jewish law and or its practices. For example, the only aspect of Judaism that is not, let's say, made up is what is contained in the five books of Moses. And this is the only part that's really divine, what we call the Humash, the Torah. The only portion that we could count on as the undistorted words of the Almighty. So yes, anything else, any other safer you will learn is not from a divine source. Not even the prophets, because honestly, the job of the prophet was not to reveal divine truth, but only to redirect us back to that divine truth, which of course has always been Torah. Now, there are two different types of developments in the Jewish world. There are authorized developments and unauthorized developments. And this is where the oral law comes in. Now, around 98% of what is known as oral law is correctly titled rabbinic law. And around less than 2% of what is known as oral law was actually given to Moses on Mount Sinai, along with the portion that was written down. But the only difference is that this portion was not written down, but transmitted orally. And actually, these were limited to less than 30 laws that accompanied certain written laws. And the rest of the 98% of the oral law falls under the category of authorized developments. Things that are not from a divine source, but were actually created from the mind of man, which is fine. Now, the reason the oral law is called the oral law is not because it was transmitted orally from Sinai, but rather that... As it was being generated by the Sanhedrin, it was preserved in an oral manner. I just thought I should insert that to limit the confusion. And friends, when I say that something is authorized, I mean that it was authorized from the Torah itself, of course, as it appears in Parashat Shoftim and many other places in Torah. The mitzvah of lo tasur, of not straying from the rulings of the great court, which were the only ones authorized to rule Jewish law into existence. And they were actually only authorized to establish Jewish laws and not belief. That's also very important. So in other words, although they had the authority to do this, everything that derived from this court still had the status of being manufactured or created by and from a human endeavor and not from a divine source or divine inspiration. Because again, the divine always only derives from the written law, from Torah Shebek Tav. And mind you, this court also disappeared after the destruction of the Second Temple. And thus today, no one else has this type of power or authority. And now friends, we will discuss what is non-authorized developments in the Jewish world. And that is pretty much every opinion or ruling held by later rabbis, either legal or mystical. Opinions that, like we said, because they existed after the Sanhedrin, and, and these individuals were not members of the Sanhedrin, i.e. did not have authentic smicha or sit on the great court, um, carried no weight in the Jewish world, and is even today disposable, meaning all their opinions or rulings. Now, as Torah Jews, we have to understand that any development that is authorized or unauthorized really are both equally void of the divine. In other words, no one can attempt or should open up anything rabbinic in an attempt to learn anything supernatural or infallible, unless, of course, it's just reiterating what's in Torah. For example, I've seen whole study sessions where the students are trying to justify the words spoken in a parak of uh, Avot as if it was said in the Torah itself. In other words, saying that only because Hillel said something, it must in some 
undoubting way be true. And worse, we must also fold our reality around it. Now, yes, if the court ruled on a legal issue, we must comply whether it is ultimately true or not in order to comply with the command found in Torah. But including Midrashim and Agadot alongside of the words in Torah and then saying that it even in the slightest way is the same is completely preposterous and unfortunately how things are actually taught nowadays. Like the famous statement uttered by many when teaching mere opinions when they say Judaism teaches or Judaism teaches this or that. And I know my friends you can relate to what I'm saying. Have you heard rabbis after saying the words Judaism teaches then spit out some Midrash or Rashi? Really my friends how far have we strayed from the proper understanding of Torah and Halakha? And the reason this is so important is because when and only when you begin to understand Torah Judaism properly, only then will you begin to elevate the words of Torah to the level they belong. Actually, if you would stop and think about so many things that you have considered divinely inspired in your Jewish walk, you would be surprised on how many were just made up. Things that were spoken of rabbis who never thought that a few hundred years or a thousand years down the road would be elevated to the level of Torah. I would honestly say that it is about 85% of what we consider Orthodox Judaism today. And this is not my opinion, it's in Shas. Everyone knows or has the ability to know this. If they don't, it's because they choose not to. Which is why even in Jewish law we have this concept of Safek de Rabbanan Lehakel and Safek de Oraita Lechumra, that in legal matters, if we have a question on a rabbinic issue, we are lenient, and if we have a question on Torah matters, we are strict. However, nowadays everyone is even stricter on the rabbinic. Why? Because there are so many opinions on it. And People completely forget about the ethical edicts in Torah, which are of course more clean cut and easier to understand and need less commentary. Because honestly, I'm sure you've seen it, more discussion on what prayers one should say or not say than if we are possibly mistreating the orphan or the stranger. And friends, this brings up another idea, and that's that one does not have to do teshuvah or repent, or in other words, ask the Almighty for forgiveness for failing to properly fulfill a rabbinic enactment, or like we call them, an authorized development, and obviously even less for an unauthorized development, like failing to say Kaddish or not praying with the Mechitza. And why not? Because, my friends, as students of Torah, we can properly distinguish between a Torah command that, by the way, we do always have to repent for, and man-made additions, either halachically binding or not. And friends, the ignorance has even entered the modern yeshiva system. I mean, honestly, since when did studying Torah only mean studying Gemara? As a matter of fact, they actually regulate Torah study only to women and children in the religious world nowadays. Can you actually believe that? Now, I don't want to speak for all yeshivot because there are many who have begun to implement the Zilberman learning method that has begun to fix much of this educational fallacy. But honestly, they really only make up less than 1% of the yeshiva system. So anyways, friends, this should act as a wake-up call to return Torah to its rightful place in our religion. And actually, everything from matrilineal descent to Kippot, Kaddish, Kabbalah, every extra biblical story that doesn't appear in the narrative, Min Hagim, Nusachot, Funny Hats, Hashkachot, Mashiach, Yard Sites, and on and on, are all developments really created by the mind of man and not from a divine source. And it's funny that when an individual tries to focus on the actual Torah, he's called less religious or less devout. It's really sad. Not to mention that it is the rabbinic that typically makes us not be able to relate to others and even sometimes look a little compulsive to the outside world that we're really supposed to be inspiring. And friends, I'm not saying that in terms of practical rabbinic halakha that this in any way should be ignored. Chas v'shalom. These laws, of course, you must diligently observe, but rather I'm saying to take a less stringent attitude towards them than you would take when keeping and adhering to Torah, which is what actually makes you look wise and special to the world. Because, friends, the ethics and the love for humanity and its creator is only found in the Torah and no other place. So, what's the purpose of rabbinic law or the authorized developments? Friends, only to unite us by helping us keep the mitzvot in a unified manner. Because our ethics only come from Torah. Torah Shebek Tav, that is, the written law. For more information on everything about Judaism, please visit doordea.com. Thank you.